Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Namu Tase Bhagavato Arhatu. Samma Sambuddhase Namo Tase Bhagavato Arehato Samma Sambuddhase Namo Tase Bhagavato Arehato Samma Sambuddhase Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Okay, my friends. So this is the sutta we today are going to talk about, and this is about um, full understanding. So he says, so the Buddha those days were at the Savati, the city where Buddha spent much of his time, lifetime. So um, Savati. So in India, okay. So he addressed the monks. So he used to live in a like fragrance cottage. We we say that the fragrance cottage. So Buddha was living there, and at the end of the day, usually like five or six or in the o'clock in the evening. So Buddha goes to the place like we call it like it's more like a meditation hall. So Buddha sit down uh, on the seat, and then he had to the monks. So all the monks gather from their rooms to that place in the evening. Right? So still today when you go there, so you can see where the Buddha exactly sat down, that seat. <laughs> and there's also the wings of that Buddha's cottage that Buddha lived. And also that hall. I went there. Yes. <laughs> it's more like this uh, this hall than much of Big, yes. So, so usually Buddha, one day when the Buddha was coming to that hall, so the monks were having some kind of a discussion. So the Buddha came to the hall and asked, uh, what were you talking about? So they said, no much important thing we discussed. Not just, mm, we just done like an idle chatter, like simple talk. So the Buddha said, uh, monks, it's not proper for you. It's not proper for you to talk like that when you gather. <laughs> when you gather together, you should do uh, two things. Else you should, if you want to talk, you should talk about the Buddha's teaching, the suttas, a Dhamma talk. And if you are not talking, so you should be, maintain your noble silence. So there are silences. Noble silence and usual silence. So what is a noble silence? In a usual silence, uh, we can spend our time with letting our mind to be wanted. But the mind is might be in the you know, past and latch on some kind of thought process so you can't exactly say. But it it's, could be a kind of uh, silence. <laughs> But Buddha said the noble silence is the silence that you that you maintain with your mind. Let's say the meditation. So you can be silent with doing meditation. You can do a loving kindness and breathing and impermanence. So these are the usual like he said that you should do meditation when you gather. If not, you should do a Dhamma talk. Because he said it's profitable for you to spend your time like that. On that day, so Buddha said like that. And this day, so Buddha went to that uh, meditation hall and he addressed the monks because without directly knowing and fully understanding the all, without developing this passion towards it and abandoning it, one is incapable of destroying suffering. So he said, without knowing directly and understanding fully the all, without developing this passion 
towards it, which means the all, and abandoning it, which means abandoning all. One is incapable of destroying something. When it comes to the Buddha, when he talks about all, so he will talk about that something called called all, everything, is with the eye and the form, ear and the sound, nose and the smell, tongue and the taste, body and the tangibles, mind and the thought. This is the all. And he said that everything, when we talk about whatever we talk about, so they, all of those things are included in this this internal sense basis and external. So he said, you should abandon it. Without fully understanding and without direct knowing these things, without developing this passion towards it, abandoning it, one is incapable of destroying suffering. So I want you to be with interacting with me uh, to this discussion because this is I have hard times to understand. And uh, yes, the teaching is learning. So while I'm talking this, and I'm really learn a lot when I'm talking this. So because of that, so let's go. And what because is that all without directly knowing and fully understanding is capable in it uh, is. One is incapable of destroying suffering. Without directly knowing and fully understanding the I, without developing dispassion towards it and abandoning it, one is incapable of destroying suffering. And without directly knowing and fully understanding the forms, eye consciousness, eye contact, and whatever the feeling arises with eye contact as condition, without developing dispassion towards it, abandoning it, one is incapable of destroying suffering. So what are the thoughts about this teaching? <laughs> okay, so let's uh, try to understand this. So my friends, the Buddha said that when we born, so we reverted with six senses, six sense faculties, eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and the mind, right? So the six sense faculties. So he says, uh, these six sense faculties, let's say the eye. So when we look at an object, like a picture or a form, so when that form, let's say, when in physics, so we talk that uh, when the light re uh, falls to the object, it reflects, and that radiation twists to the pupil of the eye, and then it creates that uh, that it 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 becomes easy to like uh, see it because of the light. So Buddha said, uh, when you look at an object through your eye, so when these two things are together. So there is also another thing that there arise that is a consciousness, right? So when we see the eye, when we see the object with our eye, so there arise eye consciousness, right? And he says, when you listen to a, let's say you are listening to a song, so you put your earbud into your uh, ear and you, the, the vibration of that sound will reach the eardrum, and that's the physics, right? So you understand that you feel that. And when these two things adds together, so there arise your consciousness, right? And when we smell something, there arise nose consciousness. And when we taste something, let's say we eat food, so when we eat, having the food, so when these two things are together, there arise a tongue consciousness. And when the uh, feelings like tangibles comes to the body, so we uh, feel that from the body consciousness and the mind. 
So the mind act like a door to the thoughts, right? So whatever we saw, whatever we heard, whatever smell, tasted, so they will comes to the mind as the thought. Do you get that? Um, so the thought is like a something coming from outside to the mind. So when the mind, uh, the thought which the mind, there arise mind consciousness, right? So in in Buddhist teachings, there are six consciousnesses. <laughs> so we have heard about the two consciousnesses, you know, like when you are riding a bike, so you you're paddling and your subconsciousness do the paddling and you watch on the outside and you see what's happening on the outside. And that's the consciousness. And the some consciousness do the other thing, like paddling, right? So like, by, but in Buddhist teachings, he said there are six consciousnesses. That doesn't mean that there are like six minds, like the cat has like seven lives, but this doesn't mean that there is like six minds, but the consciousness is a function of the mind. Did you get that? So there is a monkey. So the mind is a monkey, right? So you put it, that monkey into a cage. In the cage, there are six doors. Now the monkey, time to time, it puts the head on a one door and another door and another door, another door. So the mind is the same that uh, the consciousness will arise with the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and the mind. So the Buddha said, this consciousness is something that act like a bridge that connect with the near shore with the far shore. Did you get that? So let's say that when we have the eye, when we see the object, so it adds together when there is eye consciousness. But if there is no eye consciousness, we can't understand or we can't let us know what's in front of us. Did you get that? Yes. So let's say uh, the, the consciousness equals to the awareness. Right? The consciousness equals to the awareness. In the ancient time, they didn't have the like lighters or the matchbox. So they, but somehow they produced the fire, but how? <laughs> they had two sticks, wooden sticks, and they rubbed these together. So they produce a, a fire. Like they create the kindle. So now, as long as these two things are together, so the fire will uh, arise. But if somebody remove, like, make those two sticks apart, but that then that fire will vanish, right? So as long as these two things together, there's the uh, the, the fire. So as long as you have your eye with the form, you will have the consciousness. That is the eye consciousness, right? So, but when they change, when the eye and the form change, so the consciousness will change because it's dependent. The consciousness always is dependent. So this eye consciousness is dependent on the eye and the form. Uh, let's say that we are um, reading a book. So when we read the book, so we find the letters on the book. And when we look at the letters, so our eye will see the, like the, like the letters. And then these two things are together and the consciousness lets yourself know. So you can write the consciousness is something that lets yourself know. It lets you know, right? So the function of the consciousness is that it lets yourself know. When you listen to a song, so you have ear, so you listen that song to that song. The consciousness, it brings you this connection with your inside in sense faculties, with the outside world, outside objects. So, you know, there are times when we eat the food. So we put it in our mouth and then we chew it. And then the tongue reads uh, that makes that the, the, the taste of the food 
with the tongue that the taste reach to the tongue and then it will brings you uh, whatever the tastes are there. So the Buddha says that if uh, the whatever the taste with the food, the food is not always like the same taste, right? Sometimes you might feel the salt and you feel the sour and you feel the sweetness and you feel the bitterness of the same food. So Buddha said, the consciousness is what understand and let yourself know all the details of the taste of the food. Did you get that? So the same with the tangibles and same with the thoughts and the consciousness brings you every detail, every up and downs of the sound and every detail on the pictures and the rhythm and the function and all the smells and everything will bring to you from the consciousness. So I think that now this is enough for you to understand what is the consciousness. <laughs> so, yes. So it's kind of like you have the object and then you have your mind. The, you have the object and the mind and then the interaction of the two creates experience that you can then be aware of. When it comes to six senses, he said the mind itself is a acting like a dog. Right? A door. Uh, 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 like a door. Like a door. Like something to be like the object to the mind is the thought. But that mind itself has another function that it works with the eye. So that's the eye consciousness. Mm -hmm. Together, like collaboration. Yep. Yes. It yes. Like, let's draw the simile of the monkey. You know, the monkey itself is the mind, but the monkey put the face on the one door and another door and another door. Do you remember sometimes when we were on the bus? So we are heading back to our home from our workplace. So when we are in a kind of a thinking, something that happened in the office or somewhere that might happen in the home. So we are in trapped with that thinking. So, there is a place we want to get off, like our house, we see it, but you don't know that. You had your eye, you saw your home, but you forgot to get off because you was thinking about that thought. But why? So, you had your eye, you saw your home, but you were thinking about something which means your attention was not directed to your eye, but it was directed to your mind. So the attention goes to the, like to the ear and to the nose, to the body. The attention is what activate the consciousness. Let's say we are thinking, okay, somebody said to us something uh, when with our workplace, so you are on the bus and you're thinking about that. So at that moment, you have your mind and there is the thought of that hurting you, like something coming from you, like, like past thought. So now your attention is directed towards your mind, right? And then there arise the mind consciousness with the mind and the thought, the mind consciousness, right? So, because this attention was uh, took by the mind, actually it's craving, but later I'll describe it, but that attention was directed to the mind. So we have the connection with that mind, thought and mind consciousness, right? So all of a sudden, so if it breaks, anyhow, so again, our attention will come back to our eye. So then we will see it. Buddha said, the attention is work with all of our senses so fast that we can find how it works. But for us, because we lack mindfulness, we can see how this works. We think that these things happen all together. So when we are watching a film, let's say you are listening to the like their like talk, and your same time you are listening, you are watching that. 
but in the tool of your ear and the eye, the attention will take place. But you can't figure out that because it ha happens so fast. Buddha said, I, I tell you about er many of teachings, but I couldn't find a simile that is more match to your function of your mind. I can't find a simile to tell you about the mind. Buddha said, I mean, like, uh, by a simile, you can find you can, like Buddha said, that by a simile, we can uh, learn how the mind that mind mind functions that much fast. So he said, have you seen the animal kingdom? So the monk said, yes, we have seen animal kingdom. So he said, in the, in the, with the animals, they have many of different species. Even the birds have different colors, different shapes and different ways of their their looks and their appearance are different so the buddha said they all are because when they were in human world the way that their mind was uh, generated like the way that their mind worked brought them that kind of uh, diversity so the mind itself is much more diverse buddha said so the way they thought created that world, that realm. And he said, cannot find an exact like simile to say how this functions. Sometimes when when we're listening to a, some kind of, a, let's say, a beautiful thing like music or somebody speak to you so kindly. So now you will hear that. So you will hear that sound to your ear so when you uh, pay your so the attention is uh, take place with your ear, so you will start to hear that sound. So then there arise ear consciousness, right? So then we can see what's in front of us. It's true the mind always take one thing at a time, but we can't find that because this much fast this system works but you know like for a dead body so it doesn't have the conscious like mind the consciousness so uh, the the dead bodies uh, the, the faculties does not activate because there is no mind so when we have because we have the mind so it activates with the eye ear nose tongue body and the mind right so this is how the Buddha said that this consciousness take place, right? What is the uh, benefit of dissecting like uh, this kind of structure, the mind structure, the sense of structure? To understand, like, what is the benefit of understanding that? And, and as I get it, it's, it's this, a way this, to this, become wise, like the cultivate wisdom. Yeah. This one. Destroy suffering. And okay. Yeah. Is it because you understand like how you're creating the suffering once you dissect it? Yes. It's very difficult to conclude what kind of experience that you will achieve after abandon these things because we have this uh, attachment or we already have this attachment. So, but it need much like like uh, understanding. We need understanding. Understanding to uh, to exactly say that how it is looks like when there is no suffering. You know, if I say that you should abandon the eye, so that's you know it's quite strange. <laughs> so how you live like that <laughs> if you abandon your eye? Just want to say something about the consciousness. So I was saying, uh, let's say, if somebody is uh, seeing a form that is that attracted him, so there is yes. consciousness because of the the mind, the yes. thought of it, right? Yes. But then Bante also mentioned about attention. That's very yes. true. Now yes. um, there is also something wherein this person may compare. He what? sees other compare. So he he may see another form that is more beautiful more pleasing yes. And, yes. Then, and then his consciousness will shift to that other one 
So yes. and and what I meant to say is that there is a there is a possibility that people always compare and look for the more the the better and more beautiful ones and then go attached to it. And that's the danger. Right? And that's the yeah, yeah that's, that's the, the craving we call the craving. Yes. Okay? So yes. so there so there are many things happening in our mind because it's not only the consciousness that arise, but there's so many other consciousness. In fact, while seeing, um, he might he might also smell or hear other beautiful things, and then get get everything, all the consciousness get mixed up, right? <laughs> so it's just it's just um, I'm just uh, telling myself that the, these things all happen very fast and all at the same time. And, yes, and sometimes yes. we we, so, we get disrupted, di uh, dis yeah. disrupted with a uh, this kind of uh, yeah. Um, he just said uh, how is, uh, when there arises the craving to a certain object of when we are looking at something, so we compare it to another object which we see much more beautiful. So it takes whole attention and the and the consciousness to that uh, the new uh, beautiful object. So. We can't stop this process, you know, this happening. So it's not possible. But the understanding, that's why he said the, without understanding this, is directly knowing this, it's difficult to abandon, like destroy the suffering. That's what he said, right? So uh, so what we lack in our life is that, uh, that mm, the wisdom, the knowledge and vision from, the, from Buddhist teachings, uh, to understand how this works, right? And he says that the I, so so we talk about the I and the form and the consciousness. Now, my friends, I have to uh, go a little bit further because this is worth of understanding and uh, this is really helpful because you know how much powerful this saying of the Buddha. So he say, said that you can destroy all the sufferings. So he talks about this word, like you can overcome all the sufferings. So he said, the all, the all is your, your senses. And when you need to overcome your suffering from your all senses, so you need to understand this, right? So he said, I consciousness. Do you have trouble with understanding that how the mind and the consciousness different with each other? I think you know it already, right? So the mind is is one thing, and the function of the mind is I consciousness, the consciousness, right? What I see. So the you know the thought, um, whatever the thought is that comes to the mind is related uh, to something that we experience, something we saw, smell, tasted. For a blind person, so he can think about pictures because he didn't see pictures because he's blind. So, he, I think sometimes on when they become blind, I was just thinking maybe I'm going a bit too far. Yes. So sometimes they yes. develop images, pictures. Yes. Prior to going blind, maybe on. Yes. Yes. Me. Yes. But when he born with blindness, for such a person, right, okay. so when he want to create that thought relating to the pictures like forms, it's difficult for him to have that thought. Like let's say the colors, he can understand the colors because he never seen that. He can create a kind of a, a something which is pictures with something that he heard or experienced or touched. But that thought that with relating to the forms that we're experiencing in day-to-day -day life, so they can create such a mental thought about pictures, right? And as for a deaf person, so to think about that that thought is difficult. So which means that everything that we think is related to the form, sound, smell, taste, and tangibles. And that's the thought. I think, okay. So now uh, the way that we know that we have a mind is from the mind consciousness. The, the way that we understand that we have a mind is mind consciousness. Mind consciousness, let yourself know. Let's say that we are meditating, so you have your mind, so you are generating loving kindness meditation. 
So whenever that you think about the loving kindness thought, may I be free from anger, that thought. So the way that you let yourself know about that thought is from mind consciousness. You can't exactly uh, say that this is consciousness, but you can find it from how it functions. The way it functions is the way that we understand, oh, this is the mind consciousness. And uh, with the Buddha's teachings, the way that we reach to the teaching is by the first one is that by uh, establishing uh, faith on the Buddha by thinking that this is truth. We, we, we just play our faith that this is the exactly way this happens. And then after meditating, if you can find that, uh, that whether that is true or not, so you can believe it. But if that doesn't uh, that if you can't understand that, so you can uh, abandon it. But temporarily, temporarily, <laughs> to go to the teaching, we need a certain amount of confidence and faith because the Dhamma is what we learn, is a refuge. Right? So then, so the first days, I couldn't understand what is the consciousness is. After meditating, after uh, like like developing this permanent meditation, so I found it all. Oh, this is what the Buddha said as a consciousness. Or oh, this is uh, the Buddha said the contact. Or oh, this is the feeling. So, because it's already there, but it's something that we never heard. So when we are going to that place. So we need kind of a help from a teacher, from the Buddha. So the Buddha takes us to there and say, say just have a faith. And then if you see that, just believe. If not, just abandon. If you can't find that mind consciousness, you can abandon that. Uh, this kind of a way not to develop automatic thinking, yeah, where you take something without that, believing it. Uh, yes, because you know, we need the Dhamma to be learned as a refuge because we learn many of other things, like about planets, animals, buildings, and about trees, and about uh, airplanes, and rockets, and uh, robots, and uh, computers. When we go to the college, so you write on the paper, like, so you, you buy hard it and you write on the paper and you fail or you pass the exam, right? So that's the purpose of learning uh, the worldly, worldly subjects. There's no refuge for that. So we don't go for refuge of that. But when it comes to the Dhamma, we go refuge for that, which means we seek, uh, something to be like, to help us. I mean, like, to seek our survival. <laughs> so, Buddha said, believe, monks, the I is impermanent. Once he said, uh, believe, this I is impermanent. If we believe, if that uh, belief doesn't change, I mean, like, if that trust, confidence doesn't change, he's called a stream enter. If somebody, be, like, have the confidence on all these senses are impermanent if he has confidence by relying on the teacher, by relying on the uh, qualities of the Buddha's teachings. So we believe that Buddha is the uh, knower of the world, Buddha is uh, without, uh, he understood suffering without a teacher, and Buddha is the uh, teacher of gods and humans, and Buddha is follow the noble path and all this like, qualities, the more that we believe that qualities, whatever the Buddha say, that he says that this eye is impermanent. So uh, 
place your faith on that. So then the next day when we wake up, <laughs> so we start to see uh, this eyes impermanent. Because, I mean, like when somebody becomes enlightened, like an extreme mentor, so you know, wherever they experience uh, any kind of a feeling to their life, so they 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 have a ongoing uh, uh, like uh, uh, experience that these things are impermanent. So nobody can uh, say uh, nobody can uh, like um, like like make them believe that these things are permanent. What is a, a stream enter? One day the Buddha said about these teachings then. Uh, and he said that these uh, senses are impermanent. And this, uh, there was a person, a Brahmin. So he, as I remember, so he became a, like a, he became a stream enter. And he went back to his home, right? And the Mara, the wicked one, saw that. So he became a stream enter. Now he wanted to stop him. So he, the Mara, changed his appearance into a Buddha and went there. Before he coming to the <laughs> coming into the home, so Buddha was there. <laughs> and he said, Hey, so you met me, so I just wanted to tell you something. So I said to you that this eye is impermanent. So so I want to tell you that uh, it's not true. <laughs> he said, that's no. I said you that it is impermanent, but I, I need to tell you that this is not good there, but this is the bar, right? So he changed his form as a, as a Buddha. And he said, this is, this is not true that, that everything are not impermanent. They all are permanent. So then he thought, no, that couldn't happen. I know you are not Buddha. <laughs> he said, I know that you are not Buddha. See, the Buddha should be seen from the dumb, not just the statue and the uh, the body tree helps us, but it's just to remember, like it remember, reminds of the Buddha, but the Buddha should be seen from the Dhamma. So he said that this, so now when you like place your confidence on these uh, things as impermanent, so your mind adapt to that. I can't be late. I'm trying to understand. So what you're saying is, my understanding is the way to know, you know, the difference between, let's say, you know, tomorrow or the truth, to know it yourself. Is that kind of what you're saying? Like the truth of contemplation, understand how to take that teaching. Yes, that's the purpose of the Buddha. I mean, the, the message that Buddha brings you, that the enlightenment is within you. So realize that. By realizing that true nature of your of yourself, so then nobody can like um, like like reverse his uh, knowledge to backwards. So the Mara didn't say that it's impermanent. So <laughs> he said that it's permanent. <laughs> Only the Buddha understood this. Without the Buddha, it was there, but nobody to reveal that. So the Buddha are the uh, be you know, that the, the person that awakened himself to the truth. So he put this name that impermanence. So he says, when there is I form I consciousness, when these three things as together, that is the eye contact. I form I consciousness uh, adds together these three things. Would they put a name for that? That is the eye contact. Right? So when we uh, have ear, sound, ear consciousness, when these three things to adds together is ear contact. Nose, smell, nose consciousness adds together, nose contact. Tongue, taste, tongue consciousness adds together, tongue contact. Body tangibles, body consciousness adds together, body contact. Mind, thought, mind consciousness adds together, mind contact. 
there are six contacts. Did you get that? Let's say you meet a one of your friend, right? When you meet your friend, so he will come to you and you go uh, smile at him and you will shake hand with your friend, right? So you uh, one the, your friend is the object, like the picture, the phone, and uh, is you. And the meeting, the shaking hands is the consciousness. Do you get that? Yes. So this meet, uh, this these two persons and the shaking hands, these three things, the meeting of these three things is a contact. Right? So this is the contact. So Buddha said the collection and coming together of these three things as a contact. So my friends, by a simile, Buddha talks about the contact as like a cow that somebody removed this skin. Somebody removed all the skin from the cow. Now this cow cannot survive from the uh, beings that eat meat because now there is no skin. So wherever it goes, the beings will gather to tear the, uh, the flesh to eat. So it jump into a water to survive. Now in the water, there was crocodiles and the fish and try to eat. And it came back and leaned to a tree. In the tree, like ants and other insects comes to eat. Now we ran to a forest. In the forest, there was like tigers and wolves and lions trying to eat. And it went where there is no water, tree, or a, or a forest, just a space. But there came the, uh, like, hawks and eagles to eat. Now this uh, cow cannot survive because it's open. So the Buddha said, when you have eye for eye consciousness, this eye contact is open. Ear contact is open, nose contact is open, tongue contact is open, body contact is open, mind contact is open. Open for what? Is open. The cow is open to the flesh, to the meat, and those who eat meats, but the contact is open for the feeling. Whatever the feeling there, If it is happiness, sadness, or neutral, we have to experience. We can't stop that. Because there is contact. The contact brings us this feeling. Let's say that we see a, our friend, one of our friends. So from your eye, you see your friend and consciousness. So the contact, it brings you a happy feeling when you see your friend. But let's say somebody see an enemy, a foe. So they see that object, that, that person. So eye consciousness take place and eye contact play, take place and brings the sadness. And if there is this person who we don't know exactly, it brings the neutral. So the feeling is always there when there is contact. And contact is always there when there is consciousness and the eye and the form. So whatever, so we have our eye, whatever we see in the world, so we have to experience through the contact. So it brings us the feelings. We can stop this. Can you? So how can we destroy the suffering? By directly knowing and fully understand. What's that direct knowledge? The direct knowledge is what we just discussed. Right now, we gained that direct knowledge. And fully understanding is the understanding of cause and effect. 
the other days we try to understand this me mind myself i is me form is me consciousness is me contact is me feeling is me but now we are going to understand this as a cause and a condition cause and effect because there is i and form there is consciousness because there is contact there is feeling because there is feeling there is the next one what comes the next after the feeling i will not go much farther that much farther further but what comes out the feeling does there come to craving right buddha said if somebody says everything exists is one extreme somebody says everything exists that's one extreme and that leads to the eternalistic view that if somebody say that everything exists and if somebody say that nothing exists is the the other extreme it takes to the nihilistic view like materialistic view everything terminate after the death if somebody says uh so in the buddha teachings the buddha say he doesn't talk about these two extremes but he talks about uh when there is the condition there is the result when there is the cause there is a result when there is the i and form there is the consciousness when there is a, a gathering of these three things the i contact there is the feeling when there is the feeling there is the craving when there is a craving there is the attachment when there is the attachment because we the reason is why we attach is we want to uh, ever last that feeling so we need that something that we attached to in, be in front of us and that that uh, the craving help for that the craving takes us to that that attachment again and again and uh, you know sometimes when the people are on the social media so they um, scroll it pointlessly pointlessly and go again and again and again so he said i know that i want to stop that but i can't stop this <laughs> the reason is why he are trying to solve that problems by being thinking that as a self i want to stop that i want to take away that i want to get off with that but he said as long as you have contact you have your eye you have mobile phone and the consciousness and the eye contact and the feeling you have the feeling in that every of the pictures it brings every feelings many of happy feelings and that feelings brings the craving and that craving brings the attachment to that is not the uh, it's not wrong or be that what's happening but we need to like understand this is cause and a cause cause any effect i remember a certain person said that i'm addicted to alcohol that i wanted to stop this i can't do this i said no <laughs> so i wanted to say that but it was ended that discussion <laughs> so i said that uh, i should say that you should not try to see it as me mind myself try to see it as this is the, this is conditioning this is a succession of a conditions that's how this uh, the attachment takes place if we want to uh, like stop the attachment we need to stop the craving if we need to stop the craving we need to we need to understand the feeling and the contact and the feeling whatever arises i can take condition as a condition without developing this passion towards it abandoning it one is incapable of destroying suffering this because is the all without directly knowing and fully understanding which one is incapable of destroying suffering this is why we are meditating on this impermanence so we are trying to see it as it really is with this uh this conditioning factor so and after meditating this and when you go back to your usual lifestyle 
So you started to experience this. And you see that there's nothing to be cling on to. This, this is all about uh, uh, this working process. So you understand how you create it? Or how it is created? How, people... how it is created. How, yeah. You understand how <laughs> how it is there's no you. <laughs> I mean, oh. In a conventional sense, there is you. But ultimate truth, there is no such a thing as you, I, me, my, myself. I go on, yes. Yeah, so you understand how you how it's created? Yes. So that to break that chain of how it's created. Yes. You know what? This, because now all of us, <laughs> me and you, all, all of us, have attachment to the six senses and to the consciousness and to the forms and to the contact and to the feelings. Now we are trying to mm, realize, like we are trying to gain a kind of a, like experience how it is looks like if we abandon that. It's not easy to understand that without abandoning that, because we are holding that. But this is the in Buddha's world, this is the greatest happiness. This is the supreme bliss. Your mind always still. Your mind will not latch to your past or the future. And you're always present. And you're always having like untangling nature of your mind. Any of a situation, any of circumstances that is going through in your life, you don't attach to these things. Whatever you happens, you welcome everything. There's nothing for you to uh, deal with, I mean, like, to, no, I don't want this and I want this, no, but you welcome everything. Whatever happens, you have the open heart. You have the loving kindness for everyone. There's no limit to the loving kindness that you have because you, you don't have attachment to the world. So he said, he's free. That's the perfect liberation. You know, if you do this, if you start to do this in, in permanent meditation right now, you start to feel it by little by little, how it is like the liberation means to me. 